Hi Year 6, uh, reading chapter 14 of Sky Song today. Um, so we've just done a quick recap in class about chapter 13. Spoke about how Esker had found some courage towards the end of that last chapter. And they found out that the Ice Queen had 11 days to get Esker's voice and the rest of the voices to initiate the Sky Song. So chapter 14 is from the viewpoint of Esker once again. So... During the days that followed, Esker bound her ankle with carabao hide and filled every waking hour learning how to face the wild head-on so that she was ready for the never cliffs when the time came. She took care of her shadow when fishing. She learned to spot camouflaged snow hares by the flicker of their eyelids. She got her hunting ritual down to just a few words. She tracked snow buntings and geese to see, to see where in the snow they plucked the mountain cranberries from. And with each hour that passed, she grew to understand Balapin more. She knew which yap meant yes and which meant no. She could tell the difference between a hiss and a squawk and a cry from the clouds that could only come from an animal that knew it was free. What she didn't understand, though, was her voice, how every morning since the Ice Queen's visit, her throat felt tighter and sorer than the day before, and a strange iciness seemed to live longer in her tongue. At first she had to put it down to fear, but as the days bled on and each morning her throat became increasingly painful and the cold in her mouth grew sharper, Eska felt sure the music box key and Sliver's contraption were behind things. Was the Ice Queen inching closer and closer to stealing her voice? On the sixth morning after the Ice Queen's visit to the valley, the morning Eska planned to leave for the Never Cliffs, now that her ankle had healed, she woke to an almighty crash. She sat bolt upright in her bed and reached for the dagger under her pillow. The anthem from Winterfang was drifting through the valley, but Eska listened beyond that. There was another noise, a roaring, churning, raging sound, and it was coming from just outside the hideaway. Eska leapt out of bed, clasping her knife tight, and strained her ears towards the door. She recognised that roar. It was water, gallons of it, pouring down the valley. She edged towards the window and pulled the sacking back. Balapin was still there, tucked up in her nest, because she could tell without even opening her eyes which were the noises to be frightened of. And this ear-splitting roar was nothing to do with the Ice Queen. This was the wild talking. Eska threw on her furs, then opened the door to her hideout. The frozen fall was no longer there. Instead, a torrent of water burst over the ledge above her, cascading through the sunlight in a glittering curtain. Eska pushed her hair back from her eyes and peered through the water. She could see the whole valley, snowy hills, spliced into slivers by the waterfall, and she knew that although her ankle was strong enough for the journey onward, now and with the midnight sun only five days away, she needed to press on. She would miss these hills. They'd come to feel a bit like home. She cast her eyes towards the largest hill, the ones whose snow still clung in knee-deep layers and blinked. She could have sworn she saw something dark moving across it. She squinted harder. These shapes weren't moving like animals. They were moving, unmistakably, like humans. Eska swung her quiver over her shoulder, then crouched in the opening between the rock face and the waterfall. Balapin's eyes were fixed on the hillside. Whoever it was out there, the eagle had seen them too. For a while, Eska just watched. But, when two figures swung into a clear view around the middle of the hill, she frowned. There was no long way... They were a long way away, but even from this distance, Eska could see that they weren't especially tall, and they weren't clad in ice armour either. Members of the third tribe, she whispered. Eska watched the figures slogging through the snow. Then she listened to the Ice Queen's anthem, and thought of the command the Queen had given to her guards. Were the third tribe still safe now, that the Tusk Guards patrolled the forest? She knew she couldn't care... This was the tribe that had cast her out, but somehow she did, despite what had happened. What does that show about Eska then, if she's there, um, even though she's treat, been treated quite badly by that tribe, she's still worrying about them? What kind of person does that say Eska is? Kind, caring, caring moves on from bad moments, kind, forgiving would be a good word. She glanced up at Balapin. Come on, let's take a closer look. I need to know that Flint and his tribe are safe. Eska strode off. The eagle didn't follow but the pull of other people drew the girl away from the waterfall. She crept to the rowing trees at first, and when out in the open, she darted between rocks and ridges. She couldn't risk being seen just in case the figures were in fact tusk guards. But when she reached the foot of the largest hill and squatted down behind the boulders at its base, the remains of a long-ago landslide, Eska heard Balapin cry. High-pitched, drawn out, it was a warning. Eska scowled at the hillside for the figures and saw them halfway up, two dots against the snow. The Ice Queen's anthem drifted away. Then there was a loud grounding, grinding sound, and before Eska could even cry out, an enormous chunk of snow broke free from the summit and began sliding down the hill. The figures ran, but although they were nimble and fast, they couldn't outpace what was coming. 
because this was no ordinary avalanche. This was a hillside under the Ice Queen's control, and for some reason, it had waited now into it, until now to attack. The snow swallowed everything in its path, and as it surged down the hill, it seemed to gather itself up into a roaring mass of white. Esker's mouth dropped open. The avalanche was full of faces built from the snow itself. Horns and fangs and bulbous noses, hooded eyes, pointed ears, gaping mouths. They leered forward, spreaded jagged wings, and the snow roared around them. Realising that the avalanche was now only metres away from the figures below, Esker leapt up onto the boulders, her instinct to help, over, to help overcoming her fear of who these people might actually be. Move to the side, not down, she yelled. You can't outrun this. But her voice felt sticky in her throat, and as if the words were only just struggling out. She darted round the side of the hill and threw her arms up into the air. Over here, she cried, over here. The figures swerved towards Esker, but the avalanche was moving faster now, and with a hideous roar, the faces in the snow swallowed the figures and continued to tear down the hillside. Without thinking, Esker rushed towards the, pulsi the pulsing wall of snow. She could hear voices screaming from inside the avalanche, then something small was tossed up into the mist. It landed by Esker's boot, and she snatched it up. It was a necklace from, made from willow twine, and for a second Esker paused, as if half remembering something, but there was no time to think. If she didn't yank the victims free, they'd suffocate, or to be dashed to their deaths on the boulders at the bottom of the hill. She charged upon the mountain, ignoring the spray of ice on her face and the cries of the golden eagle circling above. Then she flung her bow to the ground, and as the avalanche reared above her, she fixed her eyes on the figures tossing and turning at its edge, and ch charged into, fr into the froze. For a second, the world turned white, but Esker knew she had to act before the snow spun her upside down, so she reached out, grabbed hold of an arm, and the snow raised around her. She yanked hard, and just a split second before she lost her footing completely, she burst free from the avalanche. She pulled back from the figure and gasped. She was face to face with Flint, and suddenly she realised who the wheel twine necklace belonged to. Blue. Esker murmured as she watched the avalanche storm towards the boulders at the bottom of the hill. Flint blinked to Esker in disbelief, and Pebble did the same from his Parker hood. Then he scrambled to his feet after his, after his little sister. But the eagle had beaten him to it, and he watched, open mouthed as the bird dug its talons into Blue's shoulders. The snow's face snarled and hissed, and one or two fl flung jagged wings towards Blue. But Balapin had now had her now. She wasn't letting go. And as the avalanche raged, raged on, the eagle dragged Blue from its sway. Eskel watched the writhing snow smash into the boulders at the bottom of the hill. And as it spilled out into the river and was carried from the valley, she thought about the Ice Queen's enchantment. I summon you, foothills, under my hold. Take the girl and the boy into your fold. The hill had waited until both she and Flint were in the valley so that it could ensnare them both at once. Flint tore down the hill towards Blue, who was lying at the side of the boulders, but Palapin rushed towards Eska, and this time the eagle didn't land beside her. She swooped to the, on the girl's shoulder, and as Eska stood on the snow-strewn hillside, she felt the bird's talons wrap around her bones, and she wondered about her past, and whether she'd been held this tight. So the Ice Queen set a bit of an avalanche on the hills, and that was that, that enchantment that she always says, so she trapped um, Eskar and Flint in the same valley and then she sent the Avalanche to try and capture them but luckily Balapin had saved them okay so next chapter chapter 15 that is from the viewpoint of Flint and that will come probably tomorrow All right, so say bye everyone bye. bye like subscribe comment do the drill